With no further ado, we will introduce to you our first speaker. Let me unshare the screen. Her name is Dr. Tamara Rial. She is a field specialist in horticulture for the greater Kansas City area. And we have the privilege of having uh, an entomologist amongst the uh, field specialists. So whenever we have insect problems, we always call upon Dr. Rial. Her presentation is as you see titled Beyond Butterflies. I don't know, Tamara, if you're going to get into the murder hornets or not, but nonetheless, insects are something that are a continual part of our life. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Tamara. Thank you so much, Dave. It's so exciting to be here. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this, of this conference and to get to talk with all of you. Um, I also want to, before I really get into it, I just want to say thank you to um, those who, who worked on putting this together, and also to all of the EMGs who are, or Extension Master Gardeners who are part of this conference. You guys do so much for us throughout the state and, and for Missouri. I appreciate it, and I know so many others do, so I just, I just had to say that while I have you guys here. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, the talk is called Beyond Butterflies, the Microcosm in Your Backyard. And if you've heard me speak, some of this might be familiar, but I've thrown in a few new things. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I want to first share a little bit of my background and entomology. Um, when people meet me and they find out I'm an entomologist, I often get asked, What's your, how did you do that? How did you get into entomology? Why would you get into studying insects? And, and so it all kind of comes back to this. Now, this is not actually my childhood backyard, but it's similar. Um, when, I was, when I was little, and, and that, that actually is a picture of me, we spent a lot of time outside. And by we, I mean all of my siblings. I come from a large family. And we just spent a lot of time outside um, of our little house. And, and it, was, it was so neat to just be out there and to play and just, you know, all those things that little kids do outside. Well, there was this one particular moment that I remember that um, we were all outside and my mom came out. And when my mom came out, she had our attention immediately because that usually meant that, that there was food to be had or maybe someone was in trouble. Um, so when she came out this time and she put her finger to her lips, we were all instantly silent. And then she started looking for something and we had no idea what she was looking for, but she, she started looking. And so then of course we were all looking, which kind of felt like a snipe hunt, you know, as from my adult perspective back on this, but we actually were looking for something. It turned out we were looking for something very small, little black, um, and, and, we didn't really know that. I, I didn't believe that, that this little thing could be making the noise that I started listening for when my mom pointed that out. And sure enough, we caught it. And again, I still don't believe it until later I actually saw it um, rubbing its legs together on the, and with the wings and, and actually making that noise. So that was my first entomology moment that I remember. Since then, I've had a lot of entomology moments. So um, I've been a beekeeper. Um, that is just fascinating. Anybody who's actually studied bees or worked with bees or had a hive in their yard um, or just bees on their flowers, it's so interesting to watch how they interact with the flowers and with the honeybees and collecting that and how they are able to produce pollen or not, they don't produce pollen, but they collect the pollen on their hind legs. And they use that in their, in their hives to build the comb and to feed their young. And it's really a, just absolutely fascinating. Of course, butterflies. Um, I, I kind of consider butterflies the gateway drug into um, entomology because people are less afraid of butterflies. They're just these flittering flowers that just fly through the air and, and just are beautiful in and of themselves. And, and anyway, there's, there's so much variety. They are beneficial. Um, 
we love our butterflies. And another entomology moment um, is, is a praying mantis. When I was little, I actually had this book that said how to have a praying mantis as a pet. It may not be the exact title. Um, I can tell you that the book was not completely accurate, but I learned so much from having a praying mantis as a pet. First of all, these spines really do hurt when, when they um, get people to. Um, the head, it, it moves. Um, it's one of the rare insects that the head can actually rotate. Um, they do not drink milk from a spoon, like the book said, and they are predators, but um, it, was, it was fascinating. Um, it also recommended that I could take it for a walk if I tied a tiny little thread on it. Um, they're sit and wait predators. They don't really go on walks, but I learned those things as, as I interacted with, with these insects. So um, those are some of my entomology moments, and, and actually here's, here's another one. Um, when I, when I was growing up, I was in Idaho, and my dad took my brother and I across the country to visit his mom, um, who had a terminal illness. And, and as we crossed the country, and the landscape changed from desert to the Midwest, where we have humidity and green without watering, um, it, was, it was incredible. Um, there's also a ton of different insects out here. And and one of my first experiences with, with lightning bugs was we were outside and my dad told us just to watch as the sun started setting. And all of a sudden we started seeing these little bits of light just dashing through the air. It was magical. It was so amazing. Um, and something that I've shared with my kids and, and anybody that, that I can. Entomology moments, <laughs> if you think about that, maybe you haven't thought about that before, but I'm asking you to think about that right now. I want you to think about maybe your entomology moment. And I want you actually to share this with us. So if, if you are able to and you can access your chat, can you maybe put one or two sentences of an entomology moment that you have had? If we were in a large group, if we were all together, I'd have you talking to your neighbor, but this is the best thing we can do. So I'm actually gonna give you a minute to put your entomology moments in the chat so that we can all, um, all share those. And I'm just kind of gonna be quiet here for a second. So just go ahead and do that. Here they come. So we have some people, termites, yep. <laughs> termites can, all entomology moments are not great, so it's okay. Velvet ants, oh my goodness, yes. Oh, the, I always see something about someone collecting insects and chasing sisters. I have to admit, I, um, I actually chased one of my brothers with, with a cicada once. Here they come. If you guys are watching the chat, there are so many fun, fun little snippets. And, and I think everybody can relate to so many of these. Roly polies, walking sticks, watching caterpillars become butterflies. Ants on the driveway. Yes, there's so many. Please keep putting these things in here. I'm going to come back and I will be reading all of these, I promise. Okay, so um, another, another quote that I came across that, that I think is just fascinating. This is by Martin Rees. He's an astrophysicist, so he knows what he's talking about when he's looking at stars. But he said, what makes things baffling is their degree of complexity, not their sheer size. A star is simpler than an insect. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in the lab looking at insects under a microscope, and then even going as far as doing um, some genetic work with them, I can tell you they are endlessly fascinating. They are endlessly complex. They, they are so, they, and they are so integrated into everything we do. Um, just think about that for, for a few minutes, um, how, how a star, it's so big, it's and it, like the star that's closest and dearest to us, which is our sun, and it brings so much life to us. Um, according to this astrophysicist, insects are even more complex. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you guys just a pop quiz. Um, again, I want you to put this in the chat. The question is, where is the bug? So go ahead and put your number in the chat. Which one of these um, is, is a bug? I'll give you just another second. Oh, you guys are so good. Okay. 
I'm guessing some of you guys have seen this before, or you guys actually paid attention in your in your training. Good for you. Okay, so number we have some people are saying seven because you know ladybug. We have some people saying all of them because a lot of people would really truly consider all of these a bug. Um, my kids get on my case all the time. They're like, "Mom, they're all bugs." But um, I'm an entomologist, so I get to nerd out a little bit. And um, this one right here is a true bug. Why is this one a bug and not the others? Let, let me give you a little more information. So this is the order Hemiptera. And in the order Hemiptera, they have what's called a half wing. Um, I mean, they, they have two wings, but they it's divided into two, two parts. So this upper part here is kind of leathery and this part down here is membranous. So Hemiptera is half winged. These insects in Hemiptera also have a scutellum, this triangular part. You will see this on, on all of the Hemipterans. And they also all have piercing sucking mouth parts. This is, these are some of the defining features of insects in the order Hemiptera that are the true bugs. Now, backing out just a little bit, let's talk about insects, make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, insects, uh, this is just a general diagram. Um, they typically have, well, they all have three major body parts, and they also have um, specific other characteristics, like they all, as adults, are going to have antennae. They all are going to have compound eyes, with some exceptions. And um, they have six legs, three pairs of legs, so six legs as adults. Um, also, as adults, there are going to be two pairs of wings or four wings. Generally, there are some exceptions. And um, the reason I, I, I keep saying as adults, because some of the juveniles actually have different characteristics. So when we're talking about this, usually we're talking about um, adult insects. But with those characteristics in mind, that means that spiders are not insects, centipedes are not insects, millipedes are not insects, worms are not insects, and uh, roly polies or pill bugs, they're not insects either. Um, and all of these, a lot of people would consider a bug, but to me, they're not even an insect, so they're certainly not a bug. Something else that's really important to remember um, about insects is they have these different, uh, different stages in their life. In a complete metamorphosis, we start with an egg, and then we have these juveniles, um, the larvae and the pupa, that eventually become an adult. And in the complete metamorphosis, these small uh, juveniles are going to be very different than the adult. And the reason I'm spending a lot of extra time on this, because you, I mean, you probably had this back in junior high or high school, but it's really important to remember this because look at this, how this caterpillar, it crawls and it chews compared to the adult, which flies, and it has um, lapping or siphoning mouth parts. So very different characteristics. They, they are in different parts of habitats. Um, and, and that's really important with some of the other things that we're going to talk about. A different kind of metamorphosis for different insects is a simple metamorphosis. And that's where, yes, they start out as an egg, but then the juvenile is very similar to the adult. One of the ways you can tell the difference is the adult has wings. Um, there's also other differences, like the adult will have reproductive abilities compared to the juvenile, but um, this is a simple metamorphosis. When we look at all of the all of the species in the world, and this is just kind of a representation. It's it's old, um, and I I know that because when I look at this and it says insects and it hasn't even reached a million, um, right now we we recognize about a one and a half million species of insects, um, but that's that's increasing because more new species are being discovered all the time. Um, in comparison to plants and some of our larger animals where we, we don't usually find new species. But if we put all of the species in a chart like this, all together, look at how many insects we have. According to this chart, about half of the species are insects. Now, I do just need to point out, like I said, that we're learning more and more and we're discovering more and more. Um, and, and it's estimated that there are probably I've heard anywhere from five to 30 million different species of insects once we've finally discovered all of them. That means that this chart is gonna look very different 
Um, I'd also just like to point out that these right here, the algae, uh, protozoa, and fungi, we're also discovering more of those. So these column, these these slices of the pie will actually get much larger as well, which means that this slice and this slice are going to get smaller, um, just as we learn more. Also, really important to point out that most insect species are beneficial or neutral. So, when people find out that I'm an entomologist, usually their first questions are you know, why would you do that? Or they have an insect in mind and they're like, what is this? And then the next question is, how do I kill it? I'm hoping by the end of this presentation that if you're not already there, that you will perhaps consider that maybe the next question is, wow, I wanna learn more about it instead of how do I kill it? Um, most of our insects are beneficial or neutral and, and we need them in, in our lives. This is another quote that I found interesting. And this is by May Berenbaum, who's, uh, I'm pretty sure she's, it's safe to say that she's the most famous entomologist um, alive today. So much so, I mean, she's received a Medal of Honor. Um, she's also, um, oh, sorry, this is a National Medal of Science. Um, and then she also has a character in X-Files named after her. Um, I, I, someday, that's something that I can aspire to. But she said, there are few human activities, no matter how simple or complex, that don't relate to insects. So back to that complexity of, of insects um, and, how, <clears throat> and how they relate to our lives. Um, they really are important in our lives. Let's, let's talk about some of those ways that they're, they're important in our lives. So termites, um, we don't like them in our house. They destroy our, our structures. However, they are essential organisms in, in, the, in nature. They are a, a critical uh, organism that helps break down these large woody structures that otherwise would take a very long time, much longer than they take now. Yes, fungi can work on them and, and ants can be in there, but termites really are the workhorses that help break down these large um, wooden um, organisms that are out in, in the wild. So while, again, we don't want to have them in our house, we really do need them. They are really important with, um, for nutrient recycling. Insects are also really important in animal waste services. So um, you, you can see this, this is a dung beetle. And if you think about all the waste that gets put out um, with the many animals that are out there, what happens to it? Well, it breaks down and insects are often a huge part of that process. Dung beetle, or uh, this is a American bearing beetle is another important animal. Um, insects are animals, <laughs> but they also help with burying other animals. So just like waste um, can be in our landscapes and, and can be detrimental if it doesn't get taken care of, uh, animals when they die also uh, need to be buried and, and have that nutrient recycling happen. And insects, again, are a very important part of that process. We, if we eliminate the insects, then it takes much longer for, um, for animals to break down. And, um, and having a wide variety of insects to help with that is actually really important. Otherwise, we can end up with diseases um, spreading. So then there's also pollination services. This is a honeybee that is, you know, it, it is covered in pollen. Um, and there, there are lots of other insects involved in pollination services. This is one of our native bees. Um, we also have beetles that are out there that, that can get into flowers and spread pollen. We also have flies. I know it looks like a bee, but that's actually a surfeit fly. And, and of course, butterflies. There are so many different pollinators that are out there, um, not just butterflies. Uh, bees are actually our most important pollinator um, and flies are actually the next most important pollinator. And if you haven't seen a chart like this, um, people, people I, I've talked to many people that they're like, well, pollinators, so butterflies. And, and yes, butterflies are good pollinators, and we're going to talk more about why, why bees, but um, just, just think about what we would do if we didn't have our pollinators. There are a lot of foods that, that are able to uh, produce fruit or, or food that we eat without pollinators, but all of the good stuff, those are, those are with our pollinators, and, and bees are, are, the, are the big ones for that. 
Another benefit of insects is soil aeration. Now, most of us don't want to have ants in our homes again, and ants can be destructive in some instances, but they also do provide an ecological service, and that is their huge um, structures and colonies in, in the ground produce soil aeration. They're not the only ones. Um, termites also are creating these tunnels in the ground, which help with aeration. And of course, there's worms um, that help with that as well. Insects also provide food for animals. So, I mean, this is for our birds. We also have lizards, or in this case, a gecko that, that eat insects. Um, again, other birds, but many, many animals eat insects. And if they didn't have uh, enough insects to eat, that would um, limit their ability to um, enjoy their life. Insects also can be food for us. These are crickets. Now I do just have to say out that um, I, I used to, well, I've been a part of many different events where um, in entomology, of course, one of the most popular events uh, is, is where we might have a table with mealworms that are flavored in many different flavors like uh, garlic or cinnamon or um, any, any, anything. And, and people like to come to these and they take videos and they post it on Instagram. And, um, and, and so I would say, well, you know, I actually don't eat insects intentionally. Um, but we all eat insects one way or another. It's, it's in our food. We can't help it. In fact, there are federal regulations that, um, regulate how much, uh, in how many insect parts can actually be in our food, because it's impossible at this point to keep all insect parts out. I'm sorry if you just had breakfast. Um, but that's, that's just how it is. On the other hand, I went to a conference and there were um, some groups that were starting to break into the entomophagy market. Entomophagy is the eating of insects. And they, instead of using something like this, where it's easily noticed as an insect, they actually had ground crickets into flour and were using that to make cookies and chips and, and other delicious food. And I know it's delicious because I had some and I was blown away. Those are some of the best chocolate chip cookies I've ever had, some of the best chips I've ever had. And now I cannot say that I do not eat insects intentionally anymore, but um, I, I, I don't necessarily go here and just eat these, but, um, but I, I would eat insects. And, and by by doing this, I've started learning more about um, how insects could actually be a part of our sustainable future because they are a great protein source, um, but they have less impact, negative impact on our environment than some of the other sources that are out there. Insects also are um, a source of inspiration for new technologies. This is an article that came out a few years ago, but um, there, and there have been many since then, but cicada wings can offer new new surface technologies. Um, this this is fantastic. Insects are are incredible. They again they're incredibly complex, but they are amazing at being able to adapt to environments. And how do they do that? Um, the more we study them, the more we can learn about the technology technologies that we can adopt um, to be um, able well, to do really anything. I mean, from clothes and food and um, robotics, there's so much that we can learn about insects. So um, moving on a little bit, I, I, I mean, we're still talking about the benefits of insects, but back to this food thing, um, I, I like food. Um, insects are so important and the diversity of them are so important. Each one of the foods that are in this poster are from a bee. Um, and, and each one of these, um, well, when we think about food generally, and we're talking about, again, bees and butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles, uh, they're providing ecological services to over 85% of the world's flowering plants. They're important in 35% of the global crop production. And the European honeybee, it's a significant managed crop pollinator, but native pollinators are, are so important to the, the future of agriculture. And, and there are things that we can do to help 
um, with this process. And we're going to talk about that more today. So, um, so when we have these pollinator dependent plants, um, these, this, it's not just for us. Um, when I show these pictures of food, I, I feel like it's, I mean, it, it's important to me, but this pollinator dependent food is also really important to our wildlife. So, I mean, this would be birds, we have bears, chipmunks, skunks, foxes, squirrels, so many different insects are dependent on, on these foods that are, are um, dependent on our pollinators. And it's not just animals that are dependent on it. Um, our plants and our plant communities are dependent on, on our pollinators because the plants that they pollinate contribute to, um, to plant communities, to species continuation. Without the pollinators, they're not going to get the, the pollen to be able to develop their seeds. So really briefly, what is pollination? It's really just the transfer of pollen from one flower to another um, within the same species. And, and it's important to note that pollinators aren't doing this just out of the goodness of their heart to bring food and happiness to all. Really, it's, it's kind of a happy accident. It's more of a positive service resource mutualism. Um, they get something out of it and, and then the plant does and then we're able to benefit from that as well. Again, we've talked about the many different pollinators. We have insect pollinators. We have animal pollinators. Um, a pollinator is, is an organism that can facilitate the transfer of that pollen from one to another. There are some that are more intentional than others. A lot of these um, are not going to, well, let, let me get into that in just a second, because a lot of them do. And, and many of them I call accidental pollinators because they're just going from one flower to another. And it doesn't matter if it's the same species. But when we look at bees, we talk about them as our pollinators because they really are those workhorses of the pollinator world by far. Um, like I said, in contrast some of the others, lepidopterans are collecting nectar for food. Um, our, our wasps, flies, and beetles can be pollen feeders. Um, but when when we look at bees, they actually spend their adult lives collecting pollen to provision nests for their offspring. Um, there's a question in the chat about what happens when a pollinator picks up pollen from one plant and then goes to a different species of plant. Uh, well, nothing happens actually. It, it is not going to pollinate the other plant because plants need a specific pollen in order to have that fertilization occur. I mean, it's, it's not bad, but it doesn't, it doesn't benefit the plant in any way. Um, another question. Yes, moths, moths are pollinators. So when I talk about butterflies, um, there's butterflies, moths, skippers, all of those. So something else unique about bees is they are very hairy. If you look at this picture, you can just see all sorts of hair all over this bee. The electrostatic hairs on these bees actually attract pollen grains. So when a bee lands on a flower, the pollen comes to her. Now she also has to work the flower to get even more, but um, it's, it's this unique characteristic of, of the hairs. Um, they also are able to groom the pollen off of their body and they hold it in specialized pockets on their bodies. Bees also tend to be true to the flower types. So they visit one kind of flower at a time. This is really great for the flower uh, cross-pollination that we were talking about. So it's also really important when we're talking about bees to recognize that honeybees are just one type of bee. And there are so many different kinds of bees out there. Um, and this, this chart helps us. So seven to 11 species of honeybees. They're eusocial, meaning that they can live in a hive. There's overlapping generations. They have a caste system. So we have a queen, we have workers, we have nurse bees. We have lots of different kinds of bees there. Um, they produce honey and our other bees don't. Um, we've convinced them to live in these, these boxes, which are convenient for us to be able to take their honey or even to be able to transport them across the country. Honeybees really get into individual flowers. We have studied bees so much, hundreds of years of studying bees. Um, and, and so they make a great poster ch child for, for our pollination. Um, 
that's pollinators that are in decline. So looking at native bee species, there's over 4,000 bee species in the US and we have around 30,000 worldwide. Most of our native pollinators are solitary, meaning when an egg is laid, they don't necessarily see another of their species until it's time to find a mate. Uh, most of them do not produce honey. Most of them live in the ground, although some of them do live in cavities that might be in the pithy part of a plant um, or in holes that are naturally in the environment. Um, some of them, well, many of them are actually better pollinators than our honeybees. Many of them are specialists for specific flowers. Um, native bees are not well studied. We really need to learn more about them, um, especially because they are in decline. And, and if our honeybees um, disappear, well, we're going to need something to pollinate those flowers. And like I said, they're, our native bees are often better at pollinating. So can, I, I would hope that we would take care of them anyway. Um, and also our, our native bees will often visit flowers over greater distances. So in decline, and this is, this is in the chat too, are bees still in decline? Yes, yes, they are. Um, and, and actually all of our insects generally are in decline. This is from Xerce Society and, and just some sobering statistics, 20%, 28% of bumblebee species are in decline, 19% of butterflies in the US are at risk of extinction. Um, we, we do have a bit of a crisis going on with our, our insects. And I, I think this is kind of an interesting um, <laughs> look, it's, and it's real. So it used to be that like when I drove across the country with my dad to, um, to visit my grandma, like our entire windshield, we had to stop multiple times to, to clean our windshield. And, and now there actually are fewer insects that are coming into contact with our windshields. And while many drivers look at that as a benefit, it actually is a problem. Um, so in a lot of people, when again, when they see insects, the first thing they think of is how do I kill this? But I'm hoping that, that as we've talked about the benefits that you're going to think about how can I learn more and, and I, what is it is a very important question as we'll talk about later. But insects are really important um, selfishly if we like to eat um, and have a healthy environment and to be able to pass that on to our, our um, next generations. It's just, I just, I just find that, um, that this is just a really important topic and, and I wanna dive into it a little bit deeper. Now, you may have seen things like this in the news. Um, insect apocalypse is here. Um, like these, these are pretty major titles. And is it, is it all hype? Well, there's actually been studies that have shown that um, it, it really isn't. Um, maybe, maybe we're not going to have an, a 100% collapse anytime soon, but over 40% of insect species are actually threatened with extinction. There are certain groups that are more affected than others. Lepidoptera, that would be our butterflies and moths. Hymenoptera would be our bees and, and wasps. And dung beetles specifically in the order Coleoptera, um, those are the ones that are most uh, uh, affected. And what are the drivers of this? Habitat loss, chemicals, invasive species, and climate change. So, it's really important to be able to talk about this. Um, the more the more we learn, the more we can do, and and so it's really important to to learn more. And that's one of the reasons I love the Extension Master Gardener Program, the Master Naturalist Program, the Master Pollinator Steward Program, because it gives us an opportunity to to learn more about the world around us and how we interact with others, and that we actually can be stewards of the land, and and help. Um, and there's a lot that we can do. Now, um, we talked about four different things that are causing issues and um, loss of habitat is really important. And what, what exactly does that mean? It, it's a loss in habitat in both quantity and quality. So it used to be that we all lived um, out in rural areas and, and we all had gardens that had lots of different kinds of plants growing in them. There was always something in bloom um, and, and there were places where bees could and, and all the other insects could um, 
they had their own habitats. And, and instead, now most of the population of the world lives in urban areas. And, um, and we have these large farms, um, large monoculture farms. And, and while that's important, they're easier to, to grow our crops um, in ways that make it easier to facilitate our lifestyles in urban areas. It also has created a complication for our insects. Because when you have these large monocultures, um, they, they're often in bloom for a shorter amount of time, maybe even only two weeks. Um, it's a, just a small variety. So like where we are encouraged to eat the rainbow in order to get lots of different nutrients. Um, these monocultures are also going to be limited in, in what can be there. So bees are now having to fly farther for a lesser quality um, food source. And, and that, that is going to cause problems, just like if we ate, um, even if we were eating something healthy, like an apple, it, that's all you ate, it would, um, you'd still end up with nutrient deficiencies. So additionally, these large acreage farms break the habitats um, up, and, and so they don't connect to each other. And so, like I said, insects are having to travel farther to access food and then return to their nest or hive. So pesticide use for obvious reasons, this is included. Pesticides kill things, often insects. Um, now, the invention of pesticides was initially a boom to farming. Um, most of our, a great deal of our crops are lost to destructive pests. And, and so we can't ignore that this is a real problem, um, but killing off crop pests, it can increase yields and efficiency, but it also comes at a cost. And so we have to be aware of this so that um, so that so that we can so that we can also save the beneficials that are out there. And a lot of our beneficials are beneficial not because they're pollinating, but because they can be biocontrols and they can actually control some of these pests. We have to learn more about them, though. Um, like for a lot of our ground nesting bees, we we. Don't know, we know they're affected, but we don't know how. And, and death isn't the only way bees are affected by pesticides. There also can be sublethal effects such as decreased egg laying, decreased production, decreased coordination. And all of these can, have, can affect the health of these different insect populations. So we really need to do more research. Also, there's parasites and diseases that can affect our insects. Um, in this picture, we have a honeybee, but we also have a mite on top. This is a varroa mite. Um, it, if you were to think about it yourself, it'd be like having a, a blood-sucking dinner plate stuck to your, um, to your body. And, and that is definitely going to have an effect on the health of these, of these bees. Um, and varroa mites are an invasive pest for them. Um, there are other mites that are affecting them. So there are a lot of parasites and, and we haven't even gone into the diseases that affect our bees. Um, some, we, we need to learn more about these and we need to be careful what we do so that we don't make the problem worse. And then of course there's climate change. This would involve more extremes in weather. So where we're having um, colder winters, hotter summers, less, uh, more droughts, um, but also huge rain events. There's, there's a lot that's happening. Something else that's happening um, is phenology changes, where there's a mismatch of when flowers are in bloom and when their pollinators are active. If the pollinators can't get to plants because they bloom two weeks earlier, that obviously can, can cause a problem. So all of these things, loss of habitat, pesticide poisoning, increased pests and diseases, climate change, these, these all compound into a huge and potentially devastating problem. And I, I feel kind of badly telling you this because this is a pretty dark picture. Um, but the reason I have to share all of this is because these are all parts of bees' habitats um, and, and our pollinators' habitats. And I need you to know what they're up against so then you can help and do something about it. And that's, that's what we're going to focus on now, what you can do. Maybe even some of these things you can do today. And, and I want to point out, we really, truly, there is a lot we can do. And bees and, and our other insects, they, they can adapt and they can be resilient. And so, so if we can do anything and we should do things, it's going to help. Um, so what can you do? First, we're gonna talk about more food. Um, you can create more food. So plants, plants like food too. Um, so if you can plant more flowers, that's really going to help. Plant more flowers. If you are in a backyard, can you reserve a part of, or if you 
have a backyard, you can reserve a part of your backyard for wildflowers. In my vegetable garden, I actually have a spot that's for wildflowers and I've expanded the wildflower part to various parts of my yard. Um, you might consider native plants. Um, native plants are more in sync with our native insects in, in our local areas. Often they don't have uh, double petal rows. So like this, you can see in this purple echinacea that it has a single row. Um, this actually has many, many different flowers in here. It's a composite flower, which means they're, all of these are the little flowers, but um, the plant is gonna be less focused on being necessarily just a showstopper for us, but more what, um, back to the plant pollinator relationships that it originally was there for. And by that, tell me telling you that does not mean that you need to have ugly plants in your yard. There are so many beautiful native plants. Um, but just, just consider that. If you can't do all native, which most of us can't, um, maybe put in some native. Um, and, and you'll find that, that there's a lot that you can work with that is good for you and is, is good for our insects. If you're looking for resources to find native plants that, that work for you, Grow Native is a great site, uh, grownative.org. They have these top 10 lists that you can go and you can look for, uh, For well, there's this on, on the screen, outstanding native plants for pollinators, but they also have lists of for shady areas and for sunny areas and really for like anything that you're looking for. They have many of these top 10 sheets. Um, and, and I recommend you go and look at those. And um, Anyway, this, this is one of my favorite. Um, you have to plant things in the right place because, I mean, they can get weedy. So put it in a spot where, where it's okay for it to be a little bit weedy. Um, but I, I do recommend that you, you look at these. There, there's some, like I said, absolutely gorgeous plants that you can put in your yard. They don't necessarily just help bees, but they help all of our pollinators. So if you really truly are a butterfly gardener, go for it. Um, but there, there's lots of plants for those too. Another thing you can do is you can plant for year round blooms. So these are some crocuses that I have in my lawn. And, and we went through, uh, last year we talked about uh, pollinator friendly lawns and, and there's a video and I can try and find that link and put that in the chat for you. But these, these are actually planted in my lawn because um, I wanted to make sure that there were uh, plants that were available or flowers and pollen as, as long through the year as possible. And in the middle of the year, or sorry, at the, at the beginning of the year, when my lawn is doing nothing, um, I can have crocus growing that produces pollen and it's, it's short and it's beautiful and it cheers me up, but it's also a food source for, for pollinators that happen to be out really early in the year. Also in my lawn, because really this is just a huge area of, of um, I mean, Lawn, lawn serves a purpose. Don't, I'm not telling you not to have a lawn. And, and if you choose not to go to a lawn, that's great too. But, but lawns um, can actually have some benefit instead of just being green. And, and, and we can plant things like um, clover in there. Some clovers are better than others. White clover is, is less nutritious than like uh, crimson clover. But um, I also need to put one other disclaimer in there. I'm not part of the huge movement to like eliminate lawns completely because having short um, grassy areas close to your house is actually really important to keep a lot of those insects out of your house that can actually cause problems as well as some other um, some other pests. So having having shorter plants around the house is actually a really good thing and grass does make a good ground cover. But please please keep that in mind as we're going through it. There are lots of lots of ways to think about this. Um, and, and some people will go, will eliminate lawns and some people will um, use lawns in different ways. I've chosen to have a lawn because um, I have kids and I think that it's a great ground cover for my situation, but I also put clover in there. And, and I also let some other weeds grow in there as well because I, I want it to be um, able to help my, help my pollinators as well. So, we talked about creating more food. Um, something else you can do is creating more nesting sites. If you can leave bare ground undisturbed, that is helpful. Remember that a lot of our bees are, are um, ground nesters. So squash bees are an example. Um, they, they are specialized for squash. Um, and, and if you are lucky enough, you might end up with some of the nests 
in, in your yard um, or nearby. If you happen to see these, leave, leave that ground open. We, we talk a lot about putting mulch out, which is really good, but maybe you can leave a little bit area bare um, to help our pollinators. At this time of year, we start thinking about what do we do with all these leaves? Um, now, bagging them up and putting them out on the curb, that's the one thing I'm gonna tell you I would recommend against, because leaves can be really important. I would leave your leaves, um, if you can't leave them in your grassy areas, um, you can, if you have an area, a natural area that you can put them in, that's, that's great if you can leave them whole, because insects use that as habitat for uh, keeping the ground kind of mulched, um, but airy and, and protective. Um, in my yard, I had two large oaks as well as other trees, and that produces way more leaves than what I can handle um, that in, in my natural areas. So, so some of it does get mulched, um, but I do have areas that I'm able to leave the leaves undisturbed. And then also try to leave some plants in place through the winter. I know we all like to get in there and, and clean out our gardens and, and make it uh, look all like a clean slate for next year. But um, if you can leave some of your, your plants, um, that will be beneficial to our beneficials. And they use these pithy stems to, um, to, to, have, uh, to, to lay their eggs. And we, we want them to be able to, um, to do so. If, if you live in an area where the city or an HOA has restrictions on how, how tall some of these plants can be or if they need to be cleaned up, maybe you can take care of your front yard um, in, in that way, but in your backyard, you can have a little more leeway and you can let some areas be perhaps a little bit more wild. Um, and, and maybe if you can't leave your entire stems, you could cut them um, partway down and then just lay the, the stems um, in another place where, where any an insects that were probably nesting inside are still able to emerge the next spring. I do just want to give a little bit of a caution on, on these bee houses or bee hotels that are out there. I mean, you can make these, you can purchase them at local stores. Um, sometimes if, if they're not done right, they can actually cause more harm than good. Because just like anything, if you bring a lot of, a lot of people or a lot of animals into one spot, you're also making it a very easy place for pesticides, um, sorry, parasites to have easy access to, to the insects. And so if you do choose to use a bee hotel, you need to make sure that you sanitize them at least annually by removing all the material and cleaning the box and then replacing the stems and other material. Okay, and then finally, um, I wanna talk about uh, uh, practicing IPM. So IPM is uh, the integrated pest management. It's a science-based approach that combines a variety of techniques. Um, you need to learn more about insects and how they interact with the environment. And kind of quickly, we're going to go through this, and then I'm going to give you a few examples. So the first, first step in IPM um, is really to identify and monitor your plants. And, and to me, just so you know, just taking a step back from this, IPM is about insect management, but I, I think this is also part of, of insect stewardship. And so insect stewardship, you're going to be spending more time about um, identifying, like you can actually make a list of all the different species that you find in your backyard. I think that would be great. Um, not all insects are pests. And so as you go farther down here, you might find that um, that those are more for pests, but, um, and you only need to be here when you're looking for beneficial insects, unless your action step is to plant more flowers so that you can help them. But we do need to identify understanding the species will help you be able to figure out what a solution is if you do have a problem. And, um, and, and also, the more you learn about them, you can learn more about the different stages that they're in, because sometimes it might be too late to do anything. And so if you were to try and take action, that's not going to be good for you, the environment, or other insects. You also, like I said, need to evaluate. You, you want to be able to evaluate, um, is, is the thing that you're seeing, is that actually causing the problem? Um, you need to identify what level of damage are you willing to tolerate before you need to take action? So this is a, you know, kind of complicated figure, but um, there can be some damage that helps you stay in balance with natural enemies if you're having a pest problem, um, but you need to take care of it before you prevent, prevent, 
so to, you can prevent the damage that is at a point where, um, where it's going to destroy everything. So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, there's a lot that we can do to prevent problems. Um, planting the right plant in the right place is so critical. You heard this in your AMG training. Um, you need to do a soil test so that you know um, what, what might need to be added or whether it's, it's a good place for certain plants. Um, you need to know, are plants getting enough sunlight? If they're not getting enough sunlight, then they can actually have more problems. Um, you, there are plants that you can put in the ground, especially when we're talking about um, in your vegetable garden that are resistant to various diseases. Actually, that applies to your entire landscape. If you plant resistant plants, then you're gonna have fewer problems, um, pest problems. Again, healthy plants are less susceptible to disease and insect damage. Um, it's important to rotate your crops. It's important to monitor your plants regularly so you can catch issues right at the beginning. If you end up with a problem, this is the action step. Um, and some of the things we've been talking about earlier are our actions, you know, choosing the right plant for the right place, choosing uh, resistant species. But um, if you do need to take action, that might mean that it's um, you're, you're pulling the insect off and putting it in a, in a container of soapy water. It might mean that, um, that you're putting a barrier so that insects can't um, climb up. It, it might mean that you're putting traps out. There, there are a lot of actions that you can put out there. Um, and if you notice, I have not even talked about chemicals. So chemicals are like the last part of that action step um, if you are not able to do some of the others because most of our pesticides are not discriminatory between beneficials and pests. And so when we put things out there, we wanna make sure that we're putting the least damaging um, chemical to our environment. And then it's also really important to monitor. So I'm gonna go back to this, this step right here for evaluating. Um, it, I think it's really important to look at this evaluating and, and thresholds to figure out how we're going to be both ec uh, ecological stewards, environmental stewards, um, and helping our insect population as well as, as pests. So again, I talked about how there's this, this point at which we can have a balance with natural enemies um, and, and, our, and our pests before we get up into this economic threshold. So this um, was some kale that is in my yard. And um, I came out just a few mornings ago and I found them being completely devoured. And then I found this right here. This is a cross-striped cabbage worm on, on my kale. And it can be pretty devastating to a crop. Fortunately, I don't have a big crop and I'm, it's, I'm not completely reliant on my kale for my well-being, but um, it, it has been very damaging. Um, and, and so what I've done here, when, when I was scouting my plants in the morning and I noticed this happen, I felt like it was overnight, um, I realized that some steps I could take um, to control this is I, I brought out my container of soapy water and I just handpicked all of these things on there. Now, if I had a large acreage of this, that would not have been practical to do. But by scouting early and, and finding this, I'd be able to take a less toxic um, control method uh, to be able to keep these populations down before it ends up being a big problem. On the other hand, um, I also went outside and I'm looking at my plants, and this is one of my parsley plants. I found that <laughs> pieces, like it was, it was disappearing. And then I found this cute critter. Now, this critter, it becomes a black swallowtail butterfly. So I like that butterfly and I like this caterpillar. I, I like my parsley too, but um, I'm actually going to let the caterpillar have the plant um, because I really like what it becomes. So by identifying this insect properly, um, I know the different life stages of it. And I recognize that this is one that I, I'm, I'm not going to handpick this um, and put it in my soapy water. I'm going to allow it to live. Um, I, I use that same philosophy with other plants in my, um, 
in my garden, like tomatoes. I like the tomato hornworm. Uh, well, I don't like that, but I, I like the sphinx moth that it becomes. And so I go ahead and, and allow that one to live too. I just plant enough tomatoes for all of us. Now, there are some pests that um, you can, if you were to get on this website, the Pest Monitoring Network, uh, it helps you know what some of these pests are and when they come and when to be aware so that when you're scouting, you can be looking for them. Um, this is one that I'm sure all of you have seen. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful insect, it's the Japanese beetle, um, but it tends to do a lot of damage. And uh, on the other hand, when we look at this, there's not a ton of things we can do. We can knock down the populations in the morning if we go out and try and use our um, container of soapy water, because knowing that they actually aggregate and they send off a pheromone to bring other Japanese beetles in, when we recognize that, we can take care of some of these problems on a small scale um, in the morning um, so that it doesn't become a bigger problem later in the day and then future days after that. Uh, something important to recognize with these also is that they're only here for a, an amount of time. Having your tree completely defoliated is shocking. Um, it, but if you're taking care of your tree, making sure that it gets water in droughty periods, then your tree is going to be able to recover. Um, but what can we do for Japanese beetles? Well, like I mentioned, you can um, use a, a container with soapy water. You can cover your plants. Maybe you can't cover a big tree, but there are other plants in your garden you can. Um, one thing a lot of people think or ask me about are these, these traps. Are they effective? I'm going to say please don't use them. They are extremely effective in bringing them in to you. So um, don't use these traps. Um, but some hope on the horizon is we do have some, some uh, biocontrols that are making their way here, the tachinid fly and the tiffia wasp. That wasp, just so you know, a lot of people are scared of wasps, but this is so small, it's not coming after you. You're not even going to notice it, but it will help drop that population of Japanese beetles. So in conclusion, um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. First, consider your entomology moment. Think about that. Um, I, I'd like you to, if you can, drop something that you've learned in the chat. And I also want you to be thinking about something that you might do differently in your garden this coming year. Please put that in the chat too. I really do wanna hear from you. So if, if you can, please put those in the chat. Um, and then a few takeaways. I want you guys to be curious. That's, that's hashtag be curious. If, if you're able to get on, get on social media just for a little bit um, and type in be curious. There's some really fascinating things that are out there. Um, people have been very curious and they take these incredible pictures and look at things differently than, than we might on a day-to-day -day basis. I also want you to appreciate the diversity of life around you, especially in your own backyard. And I want you to remember that the world of insects is incredibly varied. It's complex, yet simple, and includes models that we can learn from. Thank you guys so much for having me. I, I love working with Extension Master Gardeners. I love the world of insects. Um, I, I love this job because we get to just really hone in on this and share, share the things that are most important um, to us and with others. So thank you again. I do you see one question? Um, let's see. Oh, I love that you guys are putting these things in there. Thank you so much. In terms of insect habitat, is there a better time to mow or brush hog an overgrown field? It currently has species like queen ants, lace, goldenrod, and thistle. Um, I'm going to say that in terms of insect habitat, sometimes there can be um, a better time. It kind of depends on what it is that you're trying to protect. Um, so some, something that some people might tell you to do is uh, maybe don't mow the entire thing. Maybe mow a third at a time or two thirds and leave another third there. That way, if insects are in one part but can't, but need to, um, but need to be able to um, move uh, in order to protect themselves, if you leave an area that's open that still provides those flowers or some of that habitat that can be useful for other insects. So um, some, some places need to be mowed all the way down uh, to actually um, to reduce invasive insects um, or inv invasive plants. So really it just depends on what it is that you're trying to protect. Let's see, I think I saw one other question. I had put up a couple of bee houses and was excited to see my leaf cutter colony explode. What do you clean it to avoid disturbing them? Um, that's gonna be the time of year that you, um, that you clean it. So you want to, um, like after, after you start noticing that, that insects are 
emerging, then then do it. Um, I would probably wait till the spring um, to go ahead and do it, um, or I would just even take out the things that are in there, maybe put them in another part of your yard and then sanitize it and, and fill it back up again. And, and with that, maybe if you are gonna use bee houses, smaller is better in case you need to um, eliminate or, or re, like try, try new ones. So I would just, I would have smaller ones rather than big ones. Hey, Tamara, there was a question up above that um, wanted to know if there is a movement within the highway department to plant natives on green spaces between highways. That is a great question. Um, there's there is some debate on on whether that is a good thing or not. It's I mean we always we want to have more flowers in all of the green spaces and that near highways seems like a great place. On the other hand, um, the other side of that argument is you're you're planting all these things to bring the insects where all the cars are, and so it actually can cause problems. So we need to have more flowers everywhere not just there, um, but I mean, that's, so, so I, don't have a, I don't have a yes or no answer. Um, the, the argument is, is a little bit complex both ways. Um, so, and it also needs to be able to be easily mowed. So um, yeah, not, not a good answer for that. Okay, Tamara, thank you once again for an excellent presentation.